Greetings, students. Welcome to Mr. Little's History Bites. And today we're going to be looking at Chapter 14, Part 2, The Market Economy in Medieval China. So, by the end of this History Bite, you should be able to answer these three central questions. How did environmental changes impact the Chinese economy in the Middle Ages? How did new technologies and ideas impact the Chinese economy in the Middle Ages? And how did the Chinese economy become a market economy at this time? So, with that said, let's dive right in with a quick overview of what China's economy had traditionally been up to this point. So, up to the Song and the Tang dynasties, Chinese, the Chinese economy had been mostly based around agriculture with some local production, right? Local production of silk, local production of iron, as well as other things. And merchants were not given a lot of credit, so to speak. You know, Buddhism, uh, Confucian values actually frowned upon merchants. Um, if you remember, Confucius believed in a very set hierarchy of how society ought to be, but merchants actually disrupt this hierarchy because even though they are not high on the social pyramid, they can accumulate wealth and this can disrupt the social order of how things ought to be. Buddhism, on the other hand, did not necessarily frown on merchants. Right? Buddhism was spread along the Silk Road in part because of the acts of merchants. Now, traditionally, Chinese dynasties had held a monopoly on the production of iron, salt, and silk. And this was a major source of revenue for the state. The state would determine how much was made, and the state would determine how much the state got to keep from how much was made. A kind of tax, if you will. Should also be noted that many people tried to get around these monopolies, but historically speaking, these monopolies did somewhat restrict production of tradable goods. However, there were some changes beginning with this, you know, the beginning of this course, there were some major changes. One of which was something called the fast ripening rice, aka sometimes known as champa rice, which comes from Southeast Asia. And this rice can be grown twice in a season to route resistance. And because there's so much food, this led to a noticeable population increase under the Song and the Tang dynasties. More people from more food meant bigger cities. Probably the greatest example of this was the city of Kaifeng, which was the capital of the Song dynasty for about half of the dynasty's history. And these big urban centers means that there's more of a demand for goods and services than there might have previously been. And so this more demand for goods and services means that there's more demand for people who can supply those goods and services. And so an urbanized society is a society that is creates more manufactured goods, provides more specialized services than a society that's primarily agricultural. Now, that's not to say that China was 100% urbanized, but there was a noticeable uptick in the number of cities. There were also a noticeable uptick in technological development during this time. For example, it is at this time that the creation of porcelain, which is a kind of clay with a fire glaze that allows for beautiful beautiful paintings across it was perfected. There was also an increase in silk and iron production because of the introduction of weaving machines. Uh, this applied to silk specifically. Uh, iron production increased because of an increase in trade within China. There was also a number of new trade inventions that helped trade both within China and outside of China increase. One that I've mentioned already is paper money, right? And paper money makes it easy to do business. You're not lugging around tons of heavy metal coins or copper coins or gold coins, right? You have paper and on this paper has a set of value. So this actually makes it much easier to do business. The Grand Canal, which connected northern and southern China, was a really big part of trade because it connected the markets where people wanted to buy and the creators of these goods. And so, for example, southern China grew most of the food and northern China created most of the iron, some of the silk production and porcelain. And so the Grand Canal helped internally unite China and make trade easier. The ship known as the Junk makes overseas trade a lot easier. The junk is a ship that sits low in the water um, and it has a particular sail uh, called the lug sail that makes it really easy to sail it, right? Now I'll have, there'll be a picture of there of the junk ship, but this ship um, makes its appearance as far east as Africa. 
And so, or should say as far west as Africa. And so this ship design really helped trade outside of China become a lot easier, as well as just on the Grand Canal within China. There were also a series of new economic institutions. Now, by institutions, we mean organizations, right? So, for example, we begin to see the rise of banking institutions. Now, these are merchant organized. Today, we think of government banks, right? Or we did think of government banks. Most banks are private today. But at the time, there was no such thing as a bank. And so you begin to see merchants organizing lending institutions and places to keep their money where it would be safe. And this was a sort of pooling of credit and risk together. In other words, merchants could come together and store their money in a place where it wouldn't be potentially lost. But merchants also began to pool their credit and risk together. So 10 merchants might go in on a ship to get a shipment of goods from another place, and then they would split the profits together. We begin to see this become more and more popular. We also begin to see something called flying cash, which is a fancy way of saying a loan. People could potentially get a loan uh, if they're going to undertake a trade expedition or start up an iron factory. And so this also makes it easier to do business because people can get money easier than before. So they can pursue their, their desires and they can pursue their, their economic objectives easier. We also begin to see paper money, which I've talked about before, but it's really important to understand that paper money also symbolized how much production was going on in this time in Soma, China. Merchants from other parts of the world described gold and silver being melted to produce goods and paper money being used instead. So you would literally turn in your gold and silver and use the paper money instead. And that gold and silver would just then be used to create uh, something that would then be sold for paper money. That's how active the government and the economy of Song Dynasty China was. And all of this together begins to create what we call a market economy. That is an economy mainly run by private businesses. Now, this did not mean that the government stepped entirely out of the way. But under the Song Dynasty, it is notable that the government created very few new monopolies, whereas previously under the Tang Dynasty, they created the monopoly on salt. And under the Han Dynasty, they created the monopoly on iron. Um, but under the Song Dynasty, they didn't actually create any new monopolies, or they, they created very few. And so the market economy, the economy of Song China, begins to be based almost entirely on private businesses. Some people even think that this is a forerunner to our modern capitalist economies. It saw a great increase in foreign trade, as well as the fact that paper money unintentionally made it easier to do trade and made trade freer. And so all of these together created in Song Dynasty China what we would call a market economy. I hope you can answer those essential questions by the end of this bite. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you next time.